Thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, I apologize for sending a wrong title first, because after a few weeks, I realized that using some methods, one can basically do a lot of, a lot of things that were not announced in the, in the title. So let me say that this will be the serious uh, part of the talk. And then I'll just add some uh, extra data to the, to the ingredients that were used in this proof. So let me fix a finite extension, L of QP. Uh, this time p will be any prime, so I'm not uh, assuming that p is at least 5, uh, as in Pascuna's talk. And um, let me recall that at least if p is greater than or equal to 5, you have a natural bijection between um, absolutely irreducible two-dimensional L representations of GQP And uh, un some uh, Banach space representations, let's see. Uh, with many adjectives, among them uh, absolutely irreducible, uh, unitary, admissible, uh, and I think non-ordinary. So this is realized in, uh, and let me just, for this talk, add an extra assumption here, which is satisfied implicitly uh, by work of Pascuna, if phi is at least 5, but which I will take as granted such that the reduction, if you take uh, a lattice, and if you reduce it mod p, then this is a finite length. So, Basically, the construction goes in, in two directions. You, you start with V, then you have a certain recipe, which was described in uh, marie France talk and which allows you to construct a Banach representation, which I will call pi. And you can do the opposite. You start with pi, and then you have a natural way to go to a, Banach, uh, to a Galois representation using Colmes functor. And I should say that basically here, you can allow any finite length uh, Banach representation. I mean, this is really functorial, going from here to here. Of course, you will not get absolutely irreducible representations if this is not irreducible. On the other hand, this construction is not that functorial. I mean, this is really something quite specific to two-dimensional representations. So sometime, sometimes when you try to prove things about uh, representations here which are not irreducible, you will have quite a hard time proving it by passing to the Galois side because you have to check some compatibilities. Uh, well, as Pascuna said, you can recover V from pi. Uh, this is what Colmes proves, that uh, basically V will be obtained by applying V to pi of V. Uh, and actually, what I, what I can prove based on this result plus some abstract nonsense and some difficulties arising from the fact that this construction passing from here to here is not completely functorial, I can prove that you can also recover pi from uh, g of pi, at least if pi is uh, absolutely irreducible. So it's what you guess. It's like this. And this observation was basically the starting point for proving some functional analytic um, properties of this kind of uh, Banach-based representations by passing to the Galois side using work of Colmes and some extra arguments, and then going back via, uh, via this, uh, I, uh, this bijection. So uh, th there will be two parts in the talk. The first part will be how can you recognize on this side some remarkable classes of uh, representations on the Galois side. For instance, if I give you a Banach space representation here, which is absolutely irreducible, how do you know if it comes from a crystalline, semi-stable, potentially semi-stable representation on the left-hand side? So let me state this as a theorem. So, uh, so I'm going to take a, uh, a V corresponding to pi. And then I will say that uh, V is potentially semi-stable with distinct odd state weights if and only if the associated Banach space representation has non-zero locally algebraic vectors 
and I claim that V is triangular if and only if when you look at the locally analytic vectors of the Banach space representation and then you take the naive uh, Jacquet module, this is non-zero. So this, is, this confirms Colmet's philosophy that triangular line representations correspond to the principal series uh, on the p-adic side, uh, I mean on the p-adic automorphic side. And let me just say that you can also work with uh, Emerton's locally analytic Jacquet module, the same conclusion holds. Basically, it turns out that in the two-dimensional case, when you work with absolutely irreducible Banach space representations, the two uh, Jacquet modules are the same, basically the same object. Uh, okay, so of course this is not new. I should mention this. So, remark. Uh, is it okay if I continue here or? Okay. So uh, this theorem is due to Colmes. Uh, this part is already published in the asterisk uh, volume, and this one is uh, will be published quite soon. <laughs> uh, OK, so the first part, but I should say that the proofs are completely different. I mean, his proof um, for part one uh, is basically Iwasawa theory, plus a lot of explicit reciprocity laws uh, of Perrin-Riou and Cato's type. And this one is a pretty hard analytic computation inside the Roba ring. Uh, on the other hand, I can give a pretty unitary approach for, for proving both, both results. Um, so this is due to Colmez. Second point is that uh, for number one, uh, this implication, if I am potentially semi-stable with distinct arch state weights, then I have locally algebraic vectors on the Banach uh, side. This plays a pretty important role in Emerton's proof of the Fontaine-Maser conjecture, at least in most of the cases. So let me not state the, the exact hypothesis that should be made on the representation because they are well known. Uh, basically, this is the point that makes the link between local global compatibility, which is proved by Emerton in his paper, and uh, the Fontaine-Maser conjecture. Because what he proves is that if you take your rep representation that you'd like to prove that it's modular, you look at homomorphisms from rho to a huge uh, space of uh, <laughs> periodically com completed cohomology, then this will decompose over all primes. This is a suitably normalized um, local Langlands correspondence. So you have such a decomposition, well, at least you have a map. I don't, I don't know if there is always an, if this is always an isomorphism, but at least you always have a map, which is enough in general. And uh, so if the Banach space representation here, which appears here for L equals P, if this one has non-zero locally algebraic vectors, then this whole space will have locally algebraic uh, vectors. So this one will have locally algebraic vectors. So you will have a non-zero map from this one to the locally algebraic vectors in the cohomology, and this one can be explicitly described. And it turns out that it's basically what you guess. I mean, you have uh, the inductive limit of the cohomology for all modular curves twisted uh, by suitable locally algebraic representations and then twisted by uh, cyclotomic characters. Um, so the purpose was to, to give a proof of this result, which is a bit more analytic and more natural, let's say. And the point is that one can basically prove this using an explicit uh, description of the, um, the infinitesimal action of uh, the Lie algebra of GL2 of QP acting on the locally analytic vectors, plus some uh, extra arguments which come from Pierre de Koch theory and which allow you uh, to, to do some computations with, uh, with a certain subspace of locally analytic vectors. So I will give full details in, in a few moments. And uh, the second result, uh, 
concerns uh, Pascuna's talk because uh, my dream is to find a purely analytic proof, let's say, of his, uh, of his result, I mean, of, Pascual, of uh, Colmez's uh, question. I recall that what Colmez would like to prove is that if you start with such a Banach representation, absolutely irreducible, non-ordinary, when you pass it through Colmez's Montreal functor, you get something which has dimension two, so that it really realizes a bijection here. The, of course, this is proved by Pascunas when p is at least phi. Well, I cannot prove it in full generality, unfortunately, but I think it's a pretty good start. So let me say what I can prove uh, in this case. So no assumption on p this time. You start with phi uh, as above. Then the conclusion is the following. First of all, let me say once more that phi is equal to phi of d of phi. This is really one of the, the key points. Uh, in the proof. Uh, secondly, you have Schur's lemma. As Pascuna said, this is not something that is really easy uh, to prove. And moreover, if you look at the locally analytic vectors of pi, they have uh, a generalized infinitesimal character. So this one has an infinitesimal character. something which is also not obvious a priori, uh, and which can be computed in terms of the arch state weights of d of pi. I found this uh, as a side remark in a one of Emerton's uh, papers uh, for the code's uh, anniversary. Uh, and he, yes, that. and uh, I was going to say that. This was suggested by Michael Harris. <laughs> uh, OK. Well, it turns out that it's not enough to know exactly that uh, there is an infinitesimal character. It's much more useful to know exactly how the Lie algebra acts on the locally analytic vectors. OK, so I'll try to sketch uh, the proofs of this theorem and this part. Is there a question? Yeah. What's the statement? The statement is that if I have a pi as here, then on the one hand, you can recover pi from v of pi using this recite. So, it, so then but part of the statement is that v of pi is two-dimensional? No, part of the <laughs> I mean, oh, OK, sorry. Let me say that there is a construction that Colmes construction works in this case even if v of pi has a dimension greater than 2. So you know that there is a certain sheaf uh, and so on. I'm going to, to, to say more details about that. And the part of it says that that construction works for, for v of pi. OK, and uh, thanks for pointing that, uh, for pointing that because uh, I was going to say something more about Yes? So you showed it being natural box p one. It's stable under uh, GL2 of qp, yes. But that's basically a result of Colmez. Can you, can you repeat what the assumption P is? P is, uh, is exactly as, as it's here. I mean, absolutely irreducible. No, no, P, uh, not pi, P. Is there any difference between? <laughs> do I have two pi? Oh, there is, no, uh, there is no assumption on P. Yeah, I mean, what, th this was one of the reasons to try to do this, to uh, avoid this uh, assumption P greater than or equal to phi. And basically, everything here can be proved in full generality. Uh, but however, I should point out that I have this assumption that the reduction should have a uh, finite length. And basically, this is some technical assumption because this is what Colmes does in his uh, constructions. So maybe if you work with projective systems of uh, pi gamma modules among all possible uh, finite <coughs> length sub quotients of this, maybe you should get rid of that. But let me just assume that to make life easier. And yeah, let me add this. Three, if uh, v of pi has distinct odd state weights, then dimension of v of pi is equal to two. So you have uh, basically uh, an answer to Colmes' question, at least 
when v of pi is regular. But unfortunately, I have no way to check, given pi, how do you check if this condition is satisfied. So this is not a very satisfactory result. But the proof of it is so elementary that I guess that if you, if you try to develop a, a few more arguments, maybe at the end you, you, you have a chance to prove it. Yes? So even, even when the set operator is absolutely simple, you still have a major difference there? Yes, all the time. I mean, I'm always working with generalized odd state weights here. When I say odd state weights, they are generalized odd state. But you, get an, you don't get a generalized infinitesimal character, you get an actual infinitesimal I get an, uh, yes, I get an infinitesimal character. I, I'm going to say a few words uh, just after that. Well, now I can see why I put that subtitle. Well, basically, the proofs of, of all results stated here essentially use some deep properties of this uh, involution introduced by Colmes. And uh, Marie France talked about that uh, <coughs> this morning. It is defined uh, by a limiting process, which makes it quite difficult to work with. So because the setting was a bit abstract this morning, let me just recall how it works. So let me start with v, which is absolutely irreducible two-dimensional. Maybe I should say before going on that in order to prove this result, which concerns functional analysis about p-adic Banach spaces, what you do is you work quite a lot with Colmes functor to prove this result. Then you realize that what Colmes did in his paper, I mean many of the arguments generalize, once you have that d box, uh, the, the natural box p1, is stable under GL2 of QP. A lot of the arguments work. And then you carry on with the arguments. So the point was that you can really recover pi from V of pi in the, in the irreducible case. So from now on, I'm just going to assume that V is absolutely irreducible, two-dimensional. Uh, let me recall that we have two phi gamma modules. Uh, this one is on what Colmes calls E. So this is, uh, you start with OL, you add T, then you invert T, then you p adically complete, and finally you invert P. And uh, you have this guy who is a phi gamma module on the Roba ring, which I will call R. And of course, both of them have a Frobenius, and they have an action of gamma, which is the Galois group of the cyclotomic extension of QP. And of course, this is isomorphic to ZP star. And I will let sigma A be the inverse image of A. So that sigma A of a root of unity is just Z to the A. OK, so maybe I should recall how the construction of pi works. Uh, the idea is that this d will define an equivariant sheaf on the projective line, and then uh, pi will be just global sections modulo some bounded global sections. Here I have to disagree with Marie France. Really, the, the most difficult point in Colmes construction is this part, <laughs> defining this. Uh, yeah, I mean, and also even for GL2 of QP, this is the most difficult part to prove, proving that this, uh, this subspace is stable under the action of GL2 of QP. So uh, let me tell you exactly what are the global sections. Well, the idea is that this D will define a pretty natural sheaf on ZP, and then you have to try to glue this sheaf along ZP star. And this is where the, the difficulty comes. The point is that you have a certain involution, WD, from the kernel of uh, the operator psi on D. Let me just say that this is a, a natural left inverse uh, to, to the Frobenius operator, which has some nice properties, which is explicitly defined by a pretty nasty formula. You check that any element of D can be written 
uniquely in this form, and then you define psi by this formula. So inside D, you have a natural subspace, D psi equals 0. And well, this is where the difficulty is that WD is defined by a pretty nasty formula. Uh, do I have enough space? No. So D. Well, it's already a, a big miracle that this limit really, really exists. Of course, it's absolutely not clear that this is an involution. But it turns out that it is. And there is an even more delicate point is that this involution does not really uh, have um, nice convergence properties. I mean, the series that you, the, the sequence that you defined here converges, but very slowly. So that basically you, can do, you cannot do anything with this formula. So you have to find some way to deal with, with this involution in a way that completely avoids this formula. Um, so once you have this involution, you can define the global sections. It's this D uh, thing, uh, P1. These are, of course, just pairs of sections over ZP, which have a natural compatibility condition on ZP star. And I'll just say that inside this, uh, this space, you can define a certain natural subspace such that, uh, which I will call bounded global sections. This is what Colmes calls uh, the natural cross P1. And the main theorem is that this subspace defined here uh, no, is stable under the action of GL2 of QP. I forgot to say that you can define a pretty natural action of GL2 of QP on this uh, space. And it respects this subspace. And then you pass to the quotient. And it turns out that when you define D as D cross P1 modulo D natural cross P1, this is really the, the Banach representation that you are, uh, you are waiting for. So it has all properties. Of course, this has to be checked and so on. Uh, now. The point is that when you have such a Banach representation, a very good way to, to study it is to look at the locally analytic vectors. Because those locally analytic vectors are dense in, uh, in pi. This is a non-trivial result due to Schneider and Teitelbaum. And this is what I'm going to do. I will basically not study the action of GL2 of QP on the locally analytic vectors, but only the infinitesimal action. So what happens is that in the same way, you can construct some the rig cross P1, except that there is one big uh, difficulty here, is that if you try to define WD by this formula, it does not work, simply because this sequence does not converge in the topology of the rig. So one has to do a lot of work to prove that this involution, which is here, actually extends to the rig. Well, of course, when I say extends, this really doesn't make any sense because there is no relationship between D and the rig. But the point is that inside the rig, you have a certain subspace of overconvergent elements. And that subspace also lives inside D. And then you compare the two and you extend your D rig. And let me make a conjecture, which is actually even stronger than what Pascunas proves and even stronger than what Colmez asks for, that WD if you look at the overconvergent elements in D, then, then this is not a subspace of this unless uh, dimension of D is equal to 2. Uh, let me make the statement clear, because I assume that D has dimension 2 first. The claim is that if I start with an absolutely irreducible uh, D-dimensional phi gamma module with D at least 3, and if I do this construction, of course, you see that this formula has a meaning for any phi gamma module. You mean the, the d could be dimension 1, right? Or, or 2, yeah, or, or 1. 
Exactly. I mean, if D is at least a three-dimensional, then this operator does not preserve overconvergence. And well, of course, it's not obvious that this conjecture implies uh, Colmez's question, but it does. Of course, I have no idea how to prove this kind of <laughs> result, simply because, uh, as I said, there's no reasonable way to, to deal with this kind of formula. Um, Yes, yes. Yes, 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 of course. But uh, Colmes' uh, question was about irreducible things, and I proved here that they have to be irreducible. Mm. OK. So that's about uh, analytic properties of WD. You see, you really have to be careful with this uh, involution. But it turns out that if D is two-dimensional, then it respects over convergence, so it passes to Dirig. Well, of course, one has to prove some compatibility between this one and d dagger psi equals 0, but everything works fine. So you have a similar construction of, a she of some global sections of a sheaf. And you can prove that this, all this is, of course, due to Colmez, that uh, there exists a natural surjection from the rig cross p1, which is equivariant to the locally analytic vectors of pi. That's all I'm going to use. I will not use the, the explicit description of the kernel, which can be made, but which is fairly difficult. So you see that this guy is naturally a quotient of this one. And moreover, one can prove that this is a d of age module for any compact open subgroup of GL2 of QP. Where by d of age, I mean the algebra of piadic distributions of, on age seen as a piadic manifold. So it's somehow morally also not really. Yes. I mean, you have natural surjections when you take out uh, the rig, you, you just have the cross p1, which surjects onto pi. And the same happens at the level of locally analytic vectors. But of course, the topology here is not the induced one from, uh, from pi. It's much stronger. OK, so in particular, you see that since this one contains the universal enveloping algebra of GL2, there is a natural action of the Lie algebra here. Well, here it's obvious, but here also. And the main result is the following. You can basically write down explicitly what this infinitesimal action is in, term, in terms of some connections on the Figama module introduced by Berger and uh, Fontaine. So let me write down the answer. If you look at u minus, which is 0, 1, 0, 0, lying in the Lie algebra, then you have a nice formula. You take the sand polynomial of V, you evaluate it at nabla, then you apply it to Z, and you divide by small t, where t is log of 1 plus t. Let me just call it 2i pi. This is naturally an element of the Roba ring. And p sand is the sand polynomial of the representation. And I said, what is u minus? Let me not write down the other actions, because they are fairly obvious, actually. When you look at the the formula for the action of uh, all other elements of the Lie algebra, you see that this is the only non-trivial part. So I'm not just I'm not going to spend time on that. I know, but <laughs> trust me, they are fairly obvious. <laughs> for instance, if you look at 0, 1, 0, 0, this is just multiplication by small t. And the other are pretty similar. Now, this was the fairly non-trivial point. Because actually, it turns out that this result is equivalent to the following identity. If you look at WD of t times z, then this is equal to minus this thing evaluated at WD of z divided by small t. Now, even if you accept that the definition for WD extends with the same formula, that uh, huge limit, to d rig psi equals 0, there is no way to to see that on the formula. 
There is no way to see the same polynomial appearing when you plug in t times z. And NABLA, yes, <laughs> is the connection defined by Fontaine, I think, first, then studied a lot by Berger. So this is sigma a of z minus z over a minus 1. It turns out that this limit exists for any z in the ring. And there are a lot of properties that one can read on this connection and which make some links between this connection and Piazikoj theory. Yes? Yes, I mean, you have this Lie group uh, of dimension 1, which acts on the rig, and this is just the infinitesimal action of, uh, of it. So what you see is that, of course, this is not surprising. The only, the only infinitesimal actions, action that appears on the Galois side governs the whole infinitesimal action on the, um, on the Banach side. And the amusing point is that the proof of this result <laughs> is pretty <laughs> ridiculously <laughs> easy. Is yes. It's five lines. <laughs> well, first of all, it had uh, something like 12 pages of huge computations. And then I realized that one can make it in five lines. So let me try to, to stick to five lines. I, if, I, if I do more than that, I will just stop. <laughs> <laughs> so define this thing, you want to prove that this map is 0. Right? I will do it in two steps. I will prove that it is scalar and then that it's 0. To prove that it's scalar, I'm going to prove that this is an endomorphism of the rig. I claim that this is an endomorphism. Of course, it has to commute with phi, gamma, and so on of the rig. Now, assume that for a moment, this guy using equivalence of categories and the fact that d is absolutely irreducible, this is just f. So it will follow that f is scalar. Now, how do I prove this? Well, it turns out that when you come back to the actions of uh, GL2 of QP on this d rig uh, blah, it, then you can write it as lambda times z for a certain element lambda in d of h, but which is invariant under the Mirabolic group. This is an explicit computation that you can write down. So you have a certain distribution acting on z, and which, which is moreover invariant under uh, this zp, or oh, maybe I should say zp. This is easy to, to check. It's a computation inside a distribution algebra which is fairly easy to do because you just have to, to take conjugate of, uh, of some uh, elements of the Lie algebra, and there are standard formulas for that. So when you come back and you use the fact that this commutes with this group, it turns out that this is precisely what you need in order to prove that it commutes with phi, gamma, and the Roba ring. I should only have, I, I should say that in order to prove commute, uh, that it commutes with the Roba ring, I have to prove first that it commutes with this. And then it's a, an easy density result. Yes? I know, but the endomorphisms of this one always identify with the endomorphisms of the corresponding Gal Galois representation. Simply because you can recover uh, the representation from the rig. I know you, what you are thinking on. <laughs> Uh, I discussed this uh, issue with Colmez. The point is that you, have, you may have some endomorphisms between two phi gamma modules which, come from, uh, which do not come from the Galois representation. But when you are looking at the endomorphism, this is always true. You have an explicit formula in your thesis which says how to recover V. <laughs> <laughs> I had to study a lot your thesis before doing that. <laughs> You have an explicit formula which recovers v from d rig. So then it's, it's fairly easy to see that this, is, uh, uh, that, this, that this holds. OK, so that's the first point. Oh, I already wrote two lines, three lines. <laughs> now I have two lines. So 
the second point is that you see this guy here is an element of d rig a priori because it's some u minus of z. But on the other hand, it's not clear that this is an element of d rig, right? Because you, I divide by something which has infinitely many zeros. So this, the point is that it turns out that this is always in the ring. And this holds even for any representation of any dimension. Now, if you prove this, then it turns out that f of the <coughs> rig is a subset of t times the rig, simply because f of z is defined in this way. So of course, if you have a scalar map, which sends d rig into t times d rig, it's obvious that it has to be 0. And how do you prove this? Well, this uses uh, results of Berger and Fontaine, which basically work as follows. You have some embeddings, not really from d rig, but some subspaces of d rig into v plus drum tensor v invariant under the kernel of the cyclotomic character, which are called localization maps. And then you localize at every root of unity sufficiently large, and you prove that this holds at, after this localization. And then there is a theorem of Berger who says that it's enough to do that. And how do you prove once you localized? Well, it turns out that you do not land into this huge subspace, but you, you land into something which is much, e much smaller. And that it's so much smaller that it's a free, so the image is contained into a free ln of t module of rank 2. Moreover, the reduction of this module, when you reduce it mod small t, it's simply the sen space. And the reduction of nabla mod t is simply the sen endomorphism. So then it's just a Cayley-Hamilton theorem. OK, so as promised, four lines. No, five. Now, let me pass to more serious things. How do you prove, once you have this infinitesimal action, how do you prove that there are locally algebraic vectors in the uh, potentially semi-stable case? I will just consider this direction because it's, it's a bit easier technically, but basically the same arguments work to prove the other uh, implication. So from now on, V is potentially semi-stable with uh, distinct arch state weights, which I will call 0 and k. And I want to prove that if I look at pi, there are always locally algebraic vectors inside. Now, the idea is that I will try to force um, some vectors inside pi look as if they were algebraic and then basically prove that they are algebraic. So let me say isolate a subspace, which I will call p, a pi alg c compact support here inside the locally analytic vectors, which looks like uh, a subspace of locally algebraic vectors. I will have a certain Kirillov theory in for this subspace, and I will ask that the corresponding function in the Kirillov model vanishes near 0. I forgot to say that this subspace is already contained in Kolme's article, and basically what I'm doing from now on is already contained in his paper. But the point is that he absolutely doesn't use this to prove his theorem. I mean, it's completely different. So the idea is to look at the following space. It's not going to be a natural definition, because I'm trying to make it a, a bit shorter. But that's how life is. Uh, so you look at vectors, which are locally an analytic, and such that you can find n and a with the following properties. The first one is that you 
have this identity. Here we have a natural operator, which should key off v. Imagine that key was equal to 1. You basically ask that v should be almost smooth for the part zp star 1. Right. You are trying to, to find some subspace of, of smooth vectors in the case when k equals 1. This is basically what it says. That's, these vectors look as if they were smooth for this action. And the second point, this is a bit more complicated. You have some Hecke operators. You have to take the k power because, as usual, you, you are working with spaces of locally polynomial functions, not really locally constant functions. And this condition is purely technical here. I have this. So this is a space that can be written down explicitly. Of course, it's not pretty obvious that such vectors exist. Right? But there is a result of Colmes, which uses a few techniques of, uh, I mean, which uses quite a lot of things. First of all, et al, um, almost et al extensions, then the completion in the way uh, Ser, Tate, uh, I mean Tate, Sen, uh, and then Colmes did a lot. And also another description of pi as d tilde divided by d tilde plus, at least as b of uh, qp representations. I mean, take this as a black box if you want. It's a fact which is not very difficult. This, this is really not the difficult point of the proof that this subspace pi, uh, pi add c is isomorphic as a B of QP representation. B is the Borel. To what? Well, locally polynomial functions with compact support on QP star with values in some big module X that I'm going to write down and which are invariant under gamma. So this X will come with the natural action of gamma, and I'm looking for this kind of functions. I mean, those are just functions such that f of uh, ax is equal to sigma i a f of x for any x uh, for any a in z p star. But of course, I have to tell you what is x. Well, x is a bit complicated, so it will be an inductive limit of spaces x n, and x n is going to be well, it's going to be something that appears a lot in Berger's thesis. Basically, this is related to the differential equation uh, associated to the representation v. And here you have a certain subspace, which also appears a lot. This is basically the, uh, the ln of t module generated by the image of the localization map that I was discussing previously. And it turns out that as a module with action of gamma n, this is just ln of t modulo t to the k. So a pretty simple thing. Uh, of course, the isomorphism depends on choosing a basis of the drum, but that's no problem. OK, so now you have this explicit uh, subspace x, which is in this way. You know what pi c alg looks like. And of course, if you take such a function, it is completely determined by its values on p to the i for all i in z. So this is just going to be a sum of copies of x. And why is it a direct sum and not a direct product? Simply because I'm asking that all these functions should vanish near 0. So when you look at f of p to the i, this is really 0 almost everywhere. Um, so, um, in particular, this is non-zero. This is obvious. <laughs> okay, so you have this uh, space. And the claim, this is the difficult point, is that this is contained in pi h. And basically, the difference between the two is very small. So I'm capturing almost all the, the locally algebraic vectors. For instance, if, uh, if, pi, if v is not triangular, then this is really equal. So how does it work? It's a bit technical, but not so much. The point is that one really needs a way to pass from duality at the level of pi n and the dual of pi n 
to this kind of localization maps. Yes? No, absolutely not. If I knew that, it would be easy. <laughs> yes. Basically, the point is to prove that this is stable under W. Yes. This is Borel, right? This is Borel stable, yes. And it's isomorphic as a Borel representation to this one. OK, so how does it work? Well, when you look at the way in which it is defined, you see that basically you, you are done with those two parts, so you have to deal with 1 zp01. And how do you prove this? Well, you prove that u minus to the k kills this. If you manage to prove this, then you are done. And how do you prove this? Well, the point is that you have to, to, to work by duality. This is not really easy to, to prove directly. So you have to work with, let me just say, relate duality on the PN level to duality at the level of Diderot. I mean, you have a natural duality between the Diderot of V and the Diderot of the dual of V. And then you try to somehow relate the way in which the duality here is reflected via this isomorphism to duality on this side. And there's a nice diagram, which again is due to Colmes, and I think this is the, the key point when dealing with locally algebraic vectors. And if I have five more minutes, then I will try to discuss how you can relate all this to Iwasawa theory and to get some nice reciprocity laws. Uh, so how does it work? The point is that you have a natural pairing between the dual of the locally analytic vectors and this subspace, uh, which is pi c. This is a tautological one. It goes into L. But on the other hand, you see I have this isomorphism between this one, I, I mean this bijection between this one and the sum of copies. And here, well, I'd like to, to go into the dual of this one. And the dual of this one turns out to be the product. I mean, I have a natural duality between this one and this one. And all I have to tell you is how to go from the dual of this one to a product of duals of this. And well, of course, this is the obvious one. So what you need is to define a pairing between x and itself. But that pairing is, should be pretty obvious. Is the one induced by Diderot. So let me just say that there is a natural pairing xn going to L such that the dual of xn is simply isomorphic to this field 0 of blah divided by t to the k This is an explicit computation. You, you just write down explicitly what the, um, the pairing is. It's essentially induced by the pairing at this level between the drum of V and the drum of V dual, then a residue map, and then some traces to descend go back to, to go back to, to L from Ln. So it's nothing nothing special. No, this is really Didram. I mean, the point is that the dual of D is simply a twist. So you can always twist back and have really pairings between D and itself. OK, so now you need a map from the dual here to the product of but what is the dual of x? Well, it's the projective limit of the dual of xn, right, because x is an inductive limit of xn. And well, it turns out that this guy lives inside d0r. Here I'm cheating a little bit, because at some moment you have some twists by this uh, character. So I will implicitly 
get rid of them just for the purpose of simplicity. But the point is that up to a twist by a character, this lives inside this one. And the crucial point is that this R is independent. I mean, it does not depend on the choice of an element here. This is a uniform bound of convergence for all elements that live in the jewel of pi n. And now you just have to give a map from this one to this one. And well, if you think in terms of distributions, this should be easy. Otherwise, it just looks a, as a complete mess. So let me write it down. This is you take all n sufficiently large, and then you take this over all i and z. This is basically, this looks like an integral over p to the minus i z p of e to t x over p to the n mu of x. If this was at the level of distributions, if z was some uh, um, Fourier transform of a distribution of, on q p, whoops, then this would be, so th this would look like this one. So it's not a very strange map. But uh, I wanted to write it down because I will need it in a few minutes. OK, so now it turns out that everything works nice because you see that this 5 minus n of something lands up here in field 0 of something. So then. You you reduce it mod t to the k, so you land in x and jewel. And so when you take the projective limit, you live here. And then you take over all i, and you live here. And you have this natural way to pass from, from here to here, then to l. And it turns out that all this commutes. And this is not, uh, this is not obvious. This is a, a pretty complicated computation inside uh, Fontaine rings, because one has to somehow express, uh, this is basically a manifestation of uh, a link between Fourier transform at the level of locally polynomial functions here, and some residues that appear in Fontaine rings. Let me not say more about that. So once you have this, you know how to express duality at this level, simply in terms of Kirillov model. And once you have this, then it's very, very easy to to write down explicitly, because you are interested in this with u minus to the k z. Right? You are trying to prove that u minus to the k jewel kills this one. OK, so then you just compute everything here, because you have an explicit formula for u minus, and it turns out that everything works fine. So this is just an, a very easy computation. OK, now I really insisted on having five more minutes to discuss uh, some, uh, something that I find extremely interesting, because that should be the first step in finding a, a purely local proof of the compatibility between periodic and classical Langlands correspondences, which of course is proven now by, uh, uh, by Emerton and uh, Colmes. I mean, combining a global argument with a purely local one. But of course, it would be very nice to have a purely local proof of this compatibility. I mean, by, by which I mean, OK, now you take a Durham representation. You know that there are locally algebraic vectors. How do you describe them? What are these locally algebraic vectors? And the answer is that in the case where the, the watch state weights are 0 and k, pi algebraic should be sim to the k minus 1 L squared tensor with, uh, let me say, the local Langlands correspondence with the Tate normalization as attached to the Weyl Dolini representation attached to the DPST of B. I'm using Fontaine's uh, method, uh, recipe here to construct a Weyl Dolini representation from this DPST. Then you use local Langlands, and this should be the locally algebraic vectors. And of course, one way to prove it is using global methods trying to prove it for a sufficiently many uh, representation, representations and then prove that it's enough to prove only for those. And this is exactly how it's proved uh, up to now. But it would be also nice to manage to compute some way uh, the epsilon factors on both sides. 
right? And a way to do that, but of course, I still don't know how to, to end the argument, and I think this is just the beginning, is the following, relate epsilon factors and USOA theory. How does it work? Well, let me recall that there is a, a famous isomorphism due to Fontaine between d psi equals 1 and the Iwasawa cohomology of V. And on the other hand, you can prove that this sits naturally inside the jewel of, uh, of pi. That's also something that Emerton uses a lot in his Iwasawa theoretic arguments with modular forms. There is this nice inclusion of d psi equals 1 inside uh, the jewel of pi. Well, imagine you had a z which is invariant by p1. Then this thing becomes extremely easy, right? Because th this is just z, so you simply end up with phi minus n of z. So at the level of duality here, it's very easy to relate the action of such a z seen inside the jewel of pi to relate its action on these vectors and the Kirillov module. And let me just write down the formula. If you take this, v, this z, you see it here, and you apply it to an algebraic vector, then this is simply OK, let me explain. So delta d is simply the central character of phi. Phi v is the map in the Kirillov model attached to this locally algebraic vector v. So it was written here, locally polynomial functions. And this pairing here is the one on the level of d Duran. OK, so you have a very nice way to express such an action. And basically, it turns out that this is almost uh, a zeta function in the sense of uh, Jacques Langlands. So you have an, and more, on the other hand, it turns out that this guy, uh, using an explicit reciprocity law due to Charbonnier Colmes, this can be, uh, can be expressed in terms of dual exponential maps. So imagine that you started with the Gato element, Gato zeta element, then you know the dual exponential maps, so you know what this guy looks like. So basically, you can compute the action of the Gato element acting on algebraic vectors here simply in terms of Kirillov model. All this can be explicitly written down. Now, the big question is, what happens if you apply W? Because, of course, if you want epsilon factors, then you have to, re to relate all this with the action of W. And the amazing point is that when you apply W to something which lives here, it's still going to be here up to a twist. So you also have a very nice formula when you, you put here WZ. It's basically the same except that you are going to, to look on this part of the section living at infinity. But this is still going to be something in, in here, up to a twist. So if you put all this together, you get a very nice kind of reciprocity law. Let me write it down. You have a z in deep c, psi equals 1. You assume that wd of 1 minus phi z equals 1 minus Uh, z prime, then it turns out that phi to the minus n z, when you pair it up with this E2, which is a basis of the drum modulo d plus the drum, so this, this is exactly the kind of thing that you are interested in, this is the epsilon factor of chi minus 1 by locally constant, by which I mean the part which is locally constant inside the locally algebraic vectors, 1 over 2 psi. This is uh, the usual additive character times an explicit thing, which I'm not going to write down here, to the conductor of chi minus 1 pi locally constant, uh, and so on, times phi to the minus n this z prime e2. And let me finish by saying that this guy might very well be 0, but it's not. At least for n sufficiently large, if you apply a result of Berger on a 
universal norms, this guy is non-zero. So this allows you to express epsilon factors on the, on the Banach side in terms of some USL theoretic uh, things. But of course, the, the big difficulty is that I cannot compute this thing here in terms of DPST. Because you have to somehow have enough information about Z prime, which is defined again using this very <laughs> terrible involution. So some, somehow, you can try to, to find enough information about the dual exponential ma map attached to this Z prime, maybe by exploiting this kind of relation or something like that. Anyway, I think it's a pretty nice way to, to relate USL theory and uh, epsilon factor. Thank you very much. <laughs>